Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome from my side to the DZ Bank sponsored seminar as part of the 55th Asian Development Bank annual meeting. My name is Frank Scheidig. I'm heading the senior executive banking at DZ Bank. Beside of that, it's my honor and pleasure to be a member of the independent sustainable advisory board of the German government. We are very pleased today to have leading policymakers from around the world with us today to discuss scaling up innovative funding instrument to mobilize sustainable finance. This transition requires worldwide efforts and the importance of this topic is beyond description. And capital and financial markets are playing the, no, the crucial role. But climate change is obviously the most visible and sustainable challenge of our times. But I have to say there are many more environmental tasks that we need to address in order to have a future worth living. Furthermore, the world is not on track to achieve most of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Having said that, the role of DZ Bank has changed over the recent years from a traditional finance intermediary, even I have to say sustainability was always part of our DNA over the past 160 something years. But sustainable finance is now one of our main tasks we want to fill and fulfill. Why is it so? Because we act as a central bank for more than 800 local banks among the German country. And for those, they build and support the major of the or the majority of the German real economy, the German Mittelstand, so the SME business. And we hold nearly one third of that and supporting it with all our efforts and possible uh, products we're gonna bring to the market to support our members and their members and customers. As I said, sustainability is a core priority of DZ Bank as, a, our, as we act as a central bank to all of these before named banks. In addition to that, I think DZ Bank is leading and as an underwriter for the Euro sustainable bond market over the past years, in particular during the pandemic. But this is not enough. We don't act just in, in euros. We surely as well also support other currencies like dollars and more and more hopefully in the upcoming years, the local markets. Because if we don't help the developing countries to make sure that they can raise funding in particular on the sustainable side as well in local markets, they will have more than difficulties over the next decades to pay back their debt. So also that is part of sustainability. But we will also make sure that we provide liquidity and on the other hand, investor demand for such wide range of credits. In 2021, the DZ Bank elite managed capacity was in particular on the green, social, sustainable and sustainable linked bond side and combined a volume of more than 52 billion euros equivalent. If you take just one example of mine, the SURE program from the EU, which was a 100 billion social bond program, we underwrite with others together more than one third, 60, 36 billion euros, just of the 100 billion euro issuance. That just shows you our commitment we have, not just uh, for Germany, also for the whole Europe and parts of the rest of the world. More and more important will be the Asia Pacific and Africa region, which we will focus on. And therefore I'm very glad for the upcoming COP27, 
which is uh, being held uh, in the first two weeks of November this year in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. We are very much supporting uh, these two weeks, in particular, surely the financial day, the 9th of November, where we will be present in a pavilion uh, together, uh, in the uh, pavilion from the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, together with our partners uh, like Deloitte, for example, and many, many others. On that day, I'm very glad, and I have to mention uh, my dear colleague, Adam Cotter, and my other colleague, Marcus Pratt, who is with me here in Frankfurt, who were more than a great help to organize that. And I want to also draw your attention of a pre-COP uh, event where we're building a bridge together with uh, promotional banks around the world and policy, uh, policy makers, as well as UN officials on the 18th of October. This goes close in hand with uh, promotional banks like the ADB and many others. Um, the COP27 to me will hopefully be that what um, 20, COP26 couldn't be because of the pandemic. It was very difficult to act in the blue zone as in the years before in Madrid uh, on the COP25. But I think the spirit from all the COPs before, we will found on the ground on COP27 end of this year. And we will there will be there with more than 200 other countries together in Sharm el Sheikh. Um, we should also not forget this year, we all have in mind the tragedies, what we have seen in the Northern Hemisphere. If you can think of, I was living my whole 57 years, I'm old now in Europe, and I have never seen Europe as dry as during this last three, three months of summer. It was nearly all the big rivers were nearly empty. No shipping was possible. And if you go and further on to just recently what happened in Pakistan, this tragic flooding, we have to act. We have to act together and it has to be a global approach. So that for capital markets and the financial sector is key of the system, what I said in the beginning. If you take the energy crisis now, plus the aggression of the Russian or in particular, Mr. Putin's aggression to Ukraine has obviously bind a lot of billions which would have been needed Instead of paying it uh, and investing it in defense, we would could have used the money way more needed into uh, our world towards to a transition to become a carbon neutral society and economy. That will still happen, might be slightly delayed. I think we can't afford that. that why, that's why I personally can just ask all our member countries in the EU and the rest of the world not forget to spend that money and time what is needed to fulfill the transition in time. Um, in 2019, Europe announced a Green Deal, subsequent policy packages. Europe became the first global player um, in, in, in that field, in the net greenhouse gas emissions measured. And as a fragile consequence, you, 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 the European Green Deal and could prevent its fulfilling and its ambition for global climate leadership. And I'm pretty sure Europe will do so. But if you take Europe as the third largest um, emitter of CO2 outputs, of, uh, before, sorry, after the US and after China. So here we have to start. We have to lead by examples and encourage all the rest of the global countries to follow that path. Therefore, I'm very proud what the EU has decided and what path they're gonna go. And that's also very important if you take the Global Gateway, which is a program from the European Union decided on December 1st in 2021, investing into sustainable infrastructure developments around the globe and the world. Um, we, have a, we have a team Europe based of promotional banks 
uh, number one, it's a bank on Europe. It's the EIB, the European Investment Bank, plus, which is partner based in London, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. They together will build the team Europe and obviously make sure to mobilize the private sector in their member countries to leverage those investments and to follow their path. But the shift to a net zero economy is a development opportunity for low and middle income countries because the developed countries, in particular the EU member countries, we need to work with them and to make sure that we become energy importer from those countries. And with our technology, it is a help for both sides. Let me come to an end now and uh, make place for the first speaker, Vice President Roberta Caselli. She's in charge for finance and risk management at the Asian Development Bank. I'm very proud to have her here today. And Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Frank. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this seminar organized by DZ Bank during ADB's annual meeting. Finance is one of the key enablers to foster sustainable development. In my opening remarks today, I will elaborate on three points. First, the Asia and the Pacific region is central given its population and vulnerability to climate change. Second, the market for green, blue, and sustainability labeled bonds is growing rapidly and is crucial in tackling global challenges such as climate change and environment degradation. And third, multilateral development banks such as ADB play a leadership role in promoting best practices to develop the sustainable finance market. So coming to my first point, the Asia and the Pacific region is comprised of highly diverse countries. Despite their differences, Asian economies have come together and developed and transformed over the years, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Unfortunately, uh, this economic growth has been also accompanied by widening inequality, rapid increase in carbon emissions, widespread loss of natural habitat, and environmental degradation. The region's carbon emission trajectory is inconsistent with the Paris Climate Agreement. Asia and the Pacific is not on track in meeting the sustainable development goals, especially the environmental related SDGs, like SDG 12, 13, and SDG 14. At the same time, developing Asia is one of the regions most at risk from climate change globally, because of its dependence on natural resources and agricultural sectors, densely populated coastal areas and proportion of vulnerable people exposed to extreme climate events. More frequent and intense drought and floods will threaten food security of millions of people pushing them back into poverty. Further, environmental degradation and biodiversity loss could threaten economic development and public health, 
and put livelihoods of large parts of our societies at risk. With this, uh, let me come to the first point, to the second point. There is uh, certainly a large funding gap to meet the SDGs and scaling up, and sustainable finance is the answer. We all know that the attainment of the Global Goals Agenda 2030 requires a huge amount of financial resources. The OECD estimates that there is a funding gap of 3.7 trillion US dollars per annum to meet the SDGs by 2030, with the COVID-19 pandemic creating additional capital needs and reducing existing funding. In this situation, no single public or private player can fill this huge gap alone. Partnerships are essentials. The good news is that to collectively bridge the finance gap, we can count on an increasing investor's appetite for sustainable finance, especially through fixed income instruments. The issuance of ESG bonds is growing rapidly. BIS reports that the market for green, social, and sustainability, so-called GSS bonds, has risen more than fourfold from January 2019, reaching a record of 2.9 trillion US dollars at the end of June 2022. International financial institutions are at the forefront of this phenomenon. And this brings me to my third and final point. Multilateral development banks straddle the global financial markets and the development community. We have the convenient power to link governments with market participants. We all together have a critical opportunity and the responsibility to advocate, enable, catalyze and facilitate finance for the sustainable development agenda. ESG is embedded in our development mandate and long-term strategy aimed to help developing member countries meet the sustainable development goals. Together with our AAA rating, we have the project's pipeline, the knowledge, reputation, and trust from the market. All these elements can be connected through effective cooperation and partnerships. In response to growing investor demand for innovative fixed income instruments, ADB launched its first team bond, a water bond, in 2010. Since then, ADB has expanded its team bond offerings to green, blue, gender, health, and most recently, education bonds. The principal amount of these bond issuances as of mid-June 2022 reached nearly 21 billion US dollars. We issue in different formats, private issue, public issuances and private placement in various geographies and in 18 currencies. Through our benchmark issuances, ADB, like other international financial institutions, aims not only to mobilize more ESG finance, but to set good framework practices to further expand the market. There is always a great value in promoting standardization and strengthening external review and reporting on both funds allocations and impact. We develop 
partnerships with standard setting bodies and regulatory agencies and contribute to establishing taxonomies, guidelines, and capacity in the region. These are absolutely critical to address concerns about greenwashing, providing confidence to ESG-oriented investors, and therefore enable the GSS bond market to drive. In addition, MDBs have an important role in fostering the development of sustainable bond markets regionally as well as domestically. For example, ADB collaborated with the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum, the Forum of Securities Market Regulators, to develop the ASEAN GSS bonds standards along with the international principles set by ICMA. More than $26 billion of bonds have been issued locally under the ASEAN GSS bonds standards since 2018. Also, under the ASEAN Bond Markets Initiative, ADB closely collaborates with local regulators and market participants to establish and enabling ecosystem, including creation of local green bond verifiers. At the technical level, ADB, through the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility, supported the government of Thailand to issue in 2022 ASEAN's first local currency sovereign sustainability bond by helping project selections of applicable underlying assets, assisting a bond framework development and advising external review preparation for the bond to be recognized globally. Our support to the sustainable local currency bond markets may go beyond further. In addition to knowledge and technical support, we act as an anchor investor or guarantor to help create demand and confidence among local investors. In closing, I would like to emphasize the following. Finance, and especially fixed income, is a fundamental enabler to meet the SDGs. No single private or public player can overcome the daunting development challenges alone. Partnerships are essential. Taxonomies, guidelines, transparent and robust impact evaluation are fundamental in unlocking sustainable finance and ensure it reaches the people and countries most in need. In all this, MDBs have lighthouse role in making this happen. And don't forget, time is of the essence. Thank you very much. And I wish you all a fruitful seminar. Many thanks, Vice President Kasali, for the opening remarks. And hello to all of you joining us today. My name is Adam Cotter, joining you from the Singapore office of DZ Bank. And I have the pleasure to moderate this DZ Bank panel as part of the 55th and ADB annual meetings. In this panel, we'll be taking a look at the funding uh, decisions uh, that are taken to scale up innovative uh, funding instrument to mobilize sustainable finance. As many of you will be aware, the labeled bond sector has seen rapid growth in the last three to five years, with a particular burst in the last two years, and it now accounts for around three trillion USD worth of funding activity. The majority of which, of course, is still within green, but what we are also seeing is a green goes rainbow trend, meaning that more and more issuers are going beyond the pure environmental perspective when issuing sustainable bonds, uh, and exploring other labeled issuances. 
But there remains a lot still to consider when exploring this type of funding. And there certainly isn't a one size fits all solution for sovereign and SSA issuers. Now to discuss all these points with me, we have a really interesting panel. Uh, the title of the panel is the role of fixed income in driving the sustainable finance agenda. And we have some great thinkers from the funding space. Uh, and joining me on the panel are Erman Ahmed Abdulazim, Head of External Debt Management or Issuance, sorry, at the Egyptian Ministry of Finance. Yoshi Arima, Japan representative of the World Bank Treasury. Uh, Andrew Kennedy, Director of Treasury Services from the South Australian Government Financing Authority. Uh, Natalia Toshki, Head of Funding Unit at the Treasury Division from IFAD. Now, thank you all for joining us. And perhaps what I'd like to do is start by asking each of you to briefly introduce yourselves, your organization, and explain a bit of how your institution views the role of bonds and fixed income in driving the sustainable finance agenda for your region or, or institution. Uh, Irma, perhaps I can start with you. Yes, sure. Hi, Adam. And it's a pleasure uh, from my side to participate in this panel. Uh, uh, I am Iman Abdelazim. Uh, I'm heading the, this position and uh, as I joined Ministry of Finance uh, for uh, around 20 years ago. Uh, and I, uh, I'm, uh, yani I have my role now uh, in the management unit uh, uh, since seven years ago. Uh, my role here is responsible uh, for the external uh, issuances. Uh, conventional format and sustainable formats. Uh, uh, in, 2000, in, in 2020, we succeeded to issue the green bond and it was the first green bond uh, from a sovereign in uh, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, Egypt uh, uh, did uh, uh, a massive success under this issuance uh, and the international uh, perception from investors, from uh, institutions, uh, from other uh, sovereigns, uh, leagues from other sovereigns uh, were very good. And uh, we succeeded to uh, issue the green bond after um, uh, a quite uh, yani difficult journey of preparation uh, that, we, of course, I, I will cover during my discussion uh, with you. Uh, uh, the intention of uh, issuing the green bond uh, by the government of Egypt is to uh, emphasize on its commitment uh, 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 and care about uh, yani support the initiatives uh, of uh, in, yani improving and mitiga uh, mitigation the situation of um, uh, climate change uh, uh, that the global uh, war and world is, is facing. Thank you, Emma. Emma uh, Natalia, can I go over to you? Thank you very much, Adam, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. So I'm heading the funding team in the International Fund for Agricultural Development, which is both a specialized UN agency, but also an international financial institution based in Rome. Um, we've been established in 1978, so we've been around for <laughs> quite some time. Um, we have a very broad membership, 177 members right now, and we're active right now in, in 94 countries with more than 200 projects. So what IPAC does basically, its, its, its mission is really to um, support member states to overcome rural poverty. And uh, we are actually the only um, IFI that is exclusively focused on rural er areas and um, what we call the last mile. So our target beneficiaries are really the most marginalized um, people in rural areas where maybe sometimes our, call them bigger sisters, don't, don't operate so much. And uh, IFAD has been traditionally uh, funded through paid in capital from its member states, what we call replenishment. But we recently started tapping into financial markets. We got two ratings in 2019 um, by Standard and Poor's and Fitch, AA plus. And of course that opened up a new possibility for us that we will talk later more about, which is essentially growing our balance sheet by tapping into financial markets, which I think leads to the second part of your question. You know, what is the role of fixed income in, in development? I mean, if at the, uh, and I, I believe that the 
call it the model of multilaterals that is essentially that one of leveraging their balance sheet and accessing cheap funding sustained by their good ratings and then unlending this funding at favorable conditions for development projects. It's a model that has been working for, for many, many years. And this you know, proves the importance of fixed income and financial markets to enable this channeling of funds to development countries that don't necessarily access financial markets, or if they do, they don't access markets at these conditions. So I leave it at that and we can talk more about IFAD's funding later on. Thank you very oh, much. Great, Natalia. Uh, thanks for that. Well, let's go over to one of your bigger sisters, and, and I'd like to bring in Yoshi. Uh, Yoshi, please. Hi, thank you very much for um, arranging this uh, great uh, panel discussions. I'm very happy uh, to be here. And, uh, and the World Bank, too, uh, is uh, one of U UN specialized agencies. Um, and uh, uh, we are kind of uh, the cooperative orga organization owned by 189 uh, member countries. Uh, and our goal is uh, our two goals, uh, ex eliminating ex uh, extreme poverty and uh, promoting shared prosperity. So, and um, uh, uh, we basically, uh, from the beginning, uh, from the establishment, uh, we finance uh, the funds uh, for lending uh, by issuing uh, the World Bank bonds. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's uh, we have been issuing bonds in the international capital markets for I think uh, seventy more than seventy years. So we will. Yeah, I'm looking forward to have interesting discuss discussions uh, with you all. Thank you. Thanks, Yoshi. Yes, you certainly got a long history in this. So, and then last but not least, please, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Adam, and thanks to DB, um, DZ Bank for hosting this uh, this forum and the opportunity to talk about uh, the work that SAF is doing. So uh, my name's Andrew Kennedy. I'm the head of uh, um, Treasury Services for the South Australian Government Financing Authority, otherwise known as SAFA. Um, we act as the central borrowing authority for the state of South Australia, located in Australia. Um, our role is basically to do the debt funding for the state of South Australia. And obviously we've, as we'll elaborate a little bit further on, taken a different approach in the way that we see our role in financing and sustainable finance uh, for, the, the, uh, for the state of South Australia. So where we see our role and what we see uh, sustainable finance doing is that we've taken a long-term holistic approach regarding what governments do. And that is that everything governments do should or is aligned to the SDGs and represents um, ESG in everything that a government does. That is, they're responsible for the environment and take particular care of um, the, uh, the move towards uh, climate change, acknowledging uh, a move towards net zero and legislating around those particular requirements. Uh, governments are also mandated by the people uh, when they're elected to be socially responsible in everything they do, whether that is uh, health, education, social services, law and order. So social agenda is at the key of what a government does. And, and the people are expected, the people expect the government to also act with integrity in the way that they conduct their business, which, which involves having the right governance frameworks over everything that a government does. So... We've taken a very different view around not going down the path of label, which uh, I know we'll get onto and touch more uh, further into the conversation. But the way we view uh, what's going on in the uh, sustainable finance arena is that stakeholders in capital markets, including rating agencies, investors, they're integrating climate risk into their assessment of debt instruments, including sovereigns. So increasingly stakeholders uh, are screening the ESG credentials of debt issuers including, including uh, sovereigns like SAFA, um, over the screening of those particular debt instruments rather than, rather than so they're, they're, sorry, they're screening the credentials of the issuer rather than of the issuance. And SAFA expects these uh, practices to escalate in the face of increasing regu regulation and convergence to best practice uh, risk management and disclosures that are required so, you know, we think that these changes for future borrowing conditions will ultimately impact um, our ability to access markets 
and therefore taking a more holistic long-term view around having staff as seen as the sustainable issuer rather than doing sustainable issues or green issues is a very important step and, and highlights or underpins what we're doing towards uh, creating a sustainable finance uh, institution. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and that's, that's a good explanation. I think what, what Safra is doing is a very good case study uh, for a different route uh, in making sure you're, you're funding sustainably. Now, perhaps, uh, Erman, I could come back to you. As you mentioned, Egypt did become the first country in the Middle East and North Africa to issue a sovereign green bond. I think you, you touched on it briefly, but I mean, why is it really that you chose a green bond over other funding options and and other types of sustainable linked bonds? Yes, I am here because Egypt is uh, young, want to be committed more to its, uh, to, its uh, to its international uh, uh, agreements regarding uh, the, the climate change responsibility and wanted to, to set an example for the rest of Africa and Middle East uh, as well. Uh, why Green Bond? Because it was the most familiar uh, sustainable format at the time we issued uh, the Green Bond. Uh, Egypt uh, succeeded also to, to have uh, a role uh, beside uh, the biggest European countries. Uh, Yani, whom started uh, uh, to issue the green bond, such as Germany, uh, the biggest uh, uh, sovereign, uh, have a uh, yani, uh, biggest outstanding of, of, of green bond. Um, also, we uh, we wanted to uh, yani, uh, to put a benchmark for the to. Yeah, need to support more the private sector and to put a, a benchmark by uh, Egypt issuance to uh, encourage the private sector to go forward uh, and to move forward the green uh, uh, issuances. We also wanted to uh, diversify the investor base as the green bond to provide investors with an opportunity to invest with a fixed return in addition to uh, contribute to environmentally uh, fr uh, in, in, uh, friendly projects, because the green bond are distinguished by trans uh, uh, feature of having transparency in uh, managing public expenditures via the annual reports, which Egypt is obliged to, to, to submit to the investors on a yearly basis post issues. Um, in addition to that, we also wanted to uh, yani, uh, to prove uh, that uh, yani, uh, the green bond uh, uh, by the classification of government uh, investment having a big uh, and significant uh, portion of uh, the government uh, investment. Uh, by the physical year of 2021, uh, the year of our issuance, 35% uh, of the government uh, investment were directed to green projects. So this is yani, a brief of why we, uh, we issued green bond uh, uh, and have after having the green financing framework. Later in our in, in, in my discussion, uh, I am going to tell you that now we are working on upgrading the green financing framework uh, to have a sustainable uh, financing framework in order to be able to issue different format of sustainable bonds such as blue bond, gender bond, or social bond. All right, well, well Aman, thank you. I'll stop you there before we, we go too far into that, and we'll we'll, hold, we'll keep that for later. But I think you're right as a as a sovereign. It's a, it's a very important move for the market to be seen is, issuing these types of um, bonds. And, and as you say, it could be a, a good start to develop um, the sustainable bond market within your jurisdiction as well. So, Natalia, coming back to you, you I mean, you, you also touched upon it briefly in your introduction, but obviously IFAD had been working for many years quite successfully in supporting and, and sponsoring its projects, but what was the what was behind the decision to access the capital markets? Thank you, Adam. Um, so the the simple decision behind accessing the capital markets comes from from the demand and from the needs. 
you know, if we if we look at the latest data that were just published recently in what we call the State of Food Insecurity Report, which is a publication that is done here by our sister agency in Rome, the FAO. Um, just last year, we had more than 800 million people undernourished in the world, right? So it's basically one out of 10 people in the world that is undernourished. <laughs> and uh, in 2022, so this is if we think about it. And, uh, and of course, uh, everything is... Um, not even accounting fully for the aftermath of COVID, not even accounting fully for the food crisis that that emerges or unfortunately will emerge from the from the conflict that is going on, and uh, actually, seventy five percent of poor people live in rural areas. Right, this is something that is not always obvious because we think that rural people like live in the outskirts of big cities, but actually seventy five percent of of rural people in the world of poor people in the world live in rural areas. So if you put these things together, I mean, the role of IFA is uh, is more and more important and official development assistance, which is, you know, donor contributions has been actually hovering around five to six percent for agriculture over the overall official development assistance, because, of course, government budgets um, ha have to follow changing priorities. And uh, and so that is the reason why to have a bigger impact, as I was saying, and to grow its balance sheet, while, of course, paid in capital will always remain, you know, the backdrop of our funding strategy. We really had to tap into new into new um, financial um, sources and funding sources to make a bigger impact. And, and this was the reason behind uh, uh, obtaining a credit rating. And this was the reason behind issuing our first two private placements, which we actually issued back this year for uh, a total amount of 150 uh, million US dollars. And uh, this is really something that we hope to continue to establish a name as an issuer because ultimately um, our beneficiaries, and we see it from the demand, we see it from uh, the size of the projects that IFAD supports, which are also increasing. This is all increasing and we just need to um, drag in the private sector, whether it's through funding, whether it's through directly um, financing the private sector, but public spending will simply not, not be enough, unfortunately, if we want to meet the SDGs. Yeah, thank you, Natalia. I, I think it's a very important step. And uh, unfortunately, I think yeah, the, the role of IFAD will become more and more important, not only because of what you just said, but obviously the climate crisis and food security are so intertwined uh, and if things do progress on the climate side, um, obviously there'll be greater pressures there as well in the coming years. So, so coming back to you, Andrew, obviously, as you mentioned, SAFA has not gone down the label or labeling route. Um, so, so how do you, as a issuer, um, how do you convince the investors that you are sustainable and how do you prove that you're addressing climate change and improving socio-economic outcomes with your funding program? Oh, look, Adam, that's a really good question. And I think the best way to look at this at a very basic level is that SAFA itself does not because SAFA is only one of the agencies. We are the agency responsible for the debt funding, but we don't control the agenda or policy for government. We can provide advice to them, but ultimately the decisions that are made at a government level are government decisions and they're the ones that set the agenda and set the policy. However, at SAFA, we can do our piece and that is that we are setting the example for the rest of the government as basically the, the test case for how we can implement best practice in terms of climate management as an organisation. So, and also help the government in, its, in, its, in demonstrating its capabilities. The first part of it is that when we have the um, government mid-year budget review coming out in December, the expenditure um, aspect of the budget will be aligned to the UN SDGs. We've done a mapping process and we've received validation of that mapping process where we've taken the COFOG codes for Australia, so that's the Universal Government Expenditure Codes, and mapped them down to the SDGs, all the way down to the 169 um, different components of the SDGs. So we're showing alignment of government, government expenditure to the SDGs. Uh, on the asset side, uh, one of the business that sits within SAFA is our insurance business. Uh, so we are the insurer 
and reinsurer and captive insurer of all the state's assets. And we have a register of roughly about 61,000 assets. Uh, and those assets are well in excess of $80 billion. We're doing a mapping project uh, of all of the state's assets. And again, their alignments to the SDGs. And this is something that we'll hopefully we'll be able to publish as well. The state itself, however, only has roughly $30 billion of debt on issue. So we'll be able to show that there is an alignment between the assets that the state already owns and uh, the SDGs, as well as showing what um, current and future expenditure looks like in terms of its alignment. Um, SAFRA itself is also doing some of its own pieces. SAFRA um, has accepted the inter, um, you know, intergovernmental report on climate change and is working towards uh, a achieving certification for carbon neutral under the uh, Climate Active Plan, uh, where in the process of uh, producing SAFRA's financial reports uh, in line with the TCFD framework, and we will use that as a test to roll out across all the agencies and then potentially over the whole of government. So if we can do our piece in terms of aligning what SAFA does and then roll that out to the government, then we're setting uh, some standards and behaviours that we hope will be able to influence government behaviour. We've also created a governance group that's been signed off by the Treasurer of South Australia that will be sitting as part of a um, the, the Budget Cabinet Committee which will be providing advice into government around what best practice looks like in terms of sustainability and, and, and embedding climate risk, uh, climate risk management in all the activities that the state undertakes. So therefore looking, um, looking ahead in terms of whether that's um, procurement or any of the social programs to ensure that they're aligned to the SDGs as well. And ultimately, at this point in time, we're going out to build a sustainable bond framework that sits over the whole of our debt, explaining all these components that go into making it up, uh, making up this framework. And that, and that is the credentials that we're going out and selling to investors or, or articulating to investors at this point in time to give them confidence that when they're buying SAFA debt, that they're buying a sustainable, a, a piece of sustainable debt that has past and future and current characteristics that we believe align to the SDGs. And every step of the way along this process, we're getting third party opinion, certification and validation of the process. So we're not just doing an inward review, we're getting externally reviewed for everything we do. And ultimately, we think that they're the credentials that we're going to need as an issuer and where we think that best practice will um, drive issuers to go. And as um, I said previously, investors and rating agencies and um, global regulations are changing where they're looking through label product because of issues that have happened with greenwashing or green labeling. And so we're looking to see what's the end game, where do we need to get to? And we're about trying to do and build what is right, not what is easy. Uh, thank you, Andrew. I think it's a very interesting process that you've gone through. And I think for a lot of the listeners who will be joining us today um, from the Asia Pacific region, Obviously, the, the funding needs are growing and growing, and more municipalities or, or sub-sovereign regions are also looking to, to enter the capital markets. And I think this is quite an interesting case study, how you've approached it compared to other uh, municipalities or, or, or region regional bodies around the world as well. So thank you, Andrew. Now, uh, uh, Yoshi, we, we heard about the mapping of the SDGs there from, from Andrew and, and how South Australia is doing it. But Yoshi, could you elaborate a little bit on the sustainable funding programs of the World Bank? Uh, Treasury and also which SDGs are particular in focus? Oh, thank you. So um, in um, 2008, uh, the World Bank uh, issued uh, the first uh, green bond and also drafted the green bond principle. And now ICMA uh, is in charge of this as a secretariat. But uh, after that, uh, uh, we are now focusing uh, more uh, other uh, topics uh, too, um, such a, uh, and uh, the, as a, we would like to introduce more holistic approach uh, for financing our client uh, developing uh, uh, countries. So uh, the, the thing is, uh, for example, uh, in the past, um, we focused on, uh, very much on uh, selecting green bond eligible projects, and uh, uh, carefully uh, issue green bonds and uh, uh, ring fence, I mean, um, the, the, the earmark 
the funding, the monitor, uh, the cash flow of green bond and also green eligible projects. Uh, but the now uh, we believe that the too much ring fencing is uh, not so useful uh, both for borrowers uh, and uh, investors because uh, uh, manually doing such kind of uh, operation too much uh, is obviously a burdensome uh, for uh, the issuer and uh, it, it would result in uh, uh, the rise of uh, the interest rate that we finance to developing countries and also decrease of a coupon that uh, investors uh, receive. So uh, we, of course, uh, still continue uh, the, the, the uh, earmark uh, ring fencing for green bonds as uh, described in a green bond principle. However, we put uh, more focus uh, on a holistic approach and issuing uh, the bonds under the name of a sustainable uh, development uh, bonds. So, um, and um, one thing we, uh, last year, the end of last year, the World Bank announced uh, uh, the, go, uh, the new goal uh, to, to um, finance at least 35% uh, of the entire asset uh, to tackle uh, climate change uh, issues. So in order to achieve that, uh, the, the goal, uh, sticking too much on a green bond is not really uh, useful. So we, we decided uh, to incorporate uh, uh, the tackling, green, uh, tackling climate change issues uh, factors into entire um, 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 project uh, finance loan uh, portfolio. So in that respect, uh, we started issuing um, the, in addition to green bond, we started issuing the climate awareness um, uh, sustainable development bond. So um, and my, our track record uh, indicates uh, what which SDGs are in focus. So I can quick, I, I'll quickly uh, go through. So in 2018, we supported uh, Seychelles uh, to issue the first uh, ever uh, sovereign blue bond. And in the same year, uh, we issue uh, many uh, ocean environment uh, themed uh, uh, sustainable de development bonds. Uh, in, uh, in 2019, um, we issued as much as uh, 2 billion US equivalent uh, uh, bonds uh, with a theme of the food loss and waste. Uh, and the 2020 to 2021, um, heading for the nutrition summit in Tokyo, uh, we issue uh, multiple bonds, uh, uh, multiple bonds uh, with a theme of uh, tackling uh, nutrition uh, issues. And most recently this year, uh, we issued uh, the, the Climate Awareness uh, Sustainable Development Bond and also uh, the theme of the biodiversity. So those are the, the recent uh, uh, um, highlighting topics uh, with the World Bank bonds, but uh, of course we would like to uh, highlight as many as possible uh, important agenda uh, associated with uh, SDGs. No, thank you, Yoshi. Obviously, the, the Treasury at the World Bank remains very busy. But are, are there out of the, the the SDGs? Are there specific ones the World Bank would focus on, or, or is it all of them? Uh, some of them are not easy to really make a theme uh, for the bond, but uh, our goal is to, we, we would like to cover uh, as many as possible, uh, yeah, um, in the future. But, but the, the focus is, uh, um, uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure how many we can cover, but uh, we will make uh, our best efforts. That's a good answer, Yoshi. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Natalia, maybe I can ask a similar question to you. Does, does IFAD target specific SDGs? Thank you very much. And the discussion is, is really interesting. A lot of things that have been said resonate with IFAD as well. So um, IFAD's DNA is to start with is all about SDGs 1 and 2. I mean, that, that is our biggest focus because that is exactly why we were established. No poverty and zero hunger. Um, nevertheless, we have our strategic framework under which we operate. And the strategic framework of IFAD sets out, you know, the overarching goal of IFAD, which is basically to increase income 
because that is <laughs> the bottom line to make sustainable livelihoods. And under this um, overarching goal, we have what we call three strategic objectives, which are about increasing the access to markets of rural people, increasing production, and increasing their re resilience to climate change. So specifically on the SDGs, the um, strategic framework actually mentions seven specific SDGs, which are, as I said, one and two. Then it's SDG 5, which is the gender equality, SDG 8, which is, I believe, about um, decent economic growth, SDG 10, which is about the reduced inequalities, and then, of course, SDG 13, which is about climate action, and SDG 15, which is the one on life on land. But linked to also what Andrew was saying earlier, so in the last couple of years, um, before launching our Sustainable Development Finance Framework, which is, of course, another pillar aligned to the ICMA, as Joshi also said, we went um, through a very detailed mapping of um, what we call our core indicators, which are, you know, the indicators that we measure in our projects, and we've been measuring forever since the beginning, um, to the SDGs. So through this mapping methodology, we're actually able to, for ourselves, to figure out much better in a much clearer way to how many SDGs we actually contribute, if its interventions contribute. And it turns out that we actually contribute to 16 out of 17 SDGs. The, the only one that we don't contribute to is, is about sustainable cities, which I believe is SDG 11, but because we operate in rural areas. <laughs> so it's quite clear um, that we don't have a contribution there. You need more um, city farms. But yeah. <laughs> so, but going back to the point that Joshi was making, you know, when we looked at this and when we looked at IFAD's operations and IFAD's projects portfolio, it was very clear that uh, on a smaller scale, for us, it wouldn't have made sense to segregate the balance sheet and to earmark to what you call green or social. Because if you look at what the projects actually do, you know, you cannot call them everything else than sustainable. Then, you know, you can focus on a theme or another theme, of course. And if it has four what we call mainstreaming themes, which are gender, youth, climate and nutrition. So these are themes that are across the board of the project. Um, but, you know, this is why if it is a sustainable issuer, it wouldn't reflect what we do if we were to tag, you know, a bond, only green bond. And, uh, and that was very evident, as I said, when we did the mapping methodology, uh, but also linked to what Joshi just said, talking about climate, as I said, if at also um, mainstream climate, and we have a commitment to make sure that at least 40% of our program is tagged as climate finance, according to the common methodology for tracking climate finance, which is the one introduced by the multilateral development banks. And, and this is exactly as Joshi said, it makes much more sense for issuers and for investors, because after all, when we issue our first impact report, which will be next year, and we show the use of proceeds and we show what we contribute to, we don't want to reverse fit <laughs> what IFAD really does, you know? So, so these are, um, this, is, this is our focus. And of course, SDGs one and two, you know, that's why we were established. So with that in mind, I mean, as you say, nearly everything IFAD is going to do is, is going to be sustainable. Was, was there a need to develop the framework? Could you have not just entered the, the, the markets with a bond? <laughs> Good question. The answer is that I believe uh, that there was a need to develop the framework to allow me to say present and package IFAD and the information and our project design process and the checks and the reporting in a way that would be understood by the new audience, which were investors. So when we put together the framework and we would, when we put together the thinking about the future reporting, I have to say that it came extremely natural because everything was already there, but it was repackaging and making sure that the information could have been understood by financial market participants, which is also why we also mapped our project types to the project types that ICMA, as Joshi said, that ICMA um, lists in its sustainable um, green and social principles and guidelines. So it was a way to present the information expressing the target population in a way that also financial market participants that maybe wouldn't have known IFA five years ago could understand what we do. So that was the need for the framework. Sounds 
Very good. I'm glad you, you weren't just making more work for yourselves than needed. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it was yeah. a very natural process, I have to say. Oh man, maybe I can come back to you. You you mentioned earlier on that uh, Egypt is also looking to explore different types of bonds. Obviously, as we mentioned, you were the, one of the first countries in your region to issue a sovereign green bond. These sustainability linked bonds, as we've heard, are becoming more and more popular. So do these target linked structures have the potential to support some of the Egypt and other countries' SDGs? Yes, yes, of course. And because Egypt, the government of Egypt is already committed to achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and of course, uh, 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 the government of Egypt has already ratified Egypt Vision uh, 2030, which is aligned with 17 uh, SDGs uh, of the United Nations Goals. Uh, when we drafted the, frame, the green financing framework itself, it was aligned with six uh, uh, of SDGs, of the United Nations SDGs. And the framework came out with uh, uh, four main categories that were uh, the pool of projects uh, uh, where the allocation, the allocation of the proceeds went to. Uh, it was specified by 16% to renewable energy and 39% to pollution prevention and control, and 19% to clean transportation category, in addition to 26% went to sustainable water and wastewater management category. All of these uh, categories were serving six goals. But what we want to do now is to go broader. That's why we started the process of updating and upgrading the green financing uh, uh, framework uh, to the sustainable one. Uh, um, the process also to, uh, to, to speak more about the experience of our uh, issuance of, of green bond, it starts with uh, uh, having uh, uh, more projects from uh, uh, different ministries in order to be able to build a good uh, coverage of categories in order to be aligned with uh, many uh, of the SDG goals uh, as much as the government can uh, can put its obligation and commitment to. And because you, are, uh, you may be aware uh, that COP27 uh, will be hosted by Egypt next November, uh, inshallah, uh, that was a good motivation for us uh, to finalize the sustainable framework uh, to be done before uh, November. Uh, we started the process uh, of our journey uh, to do so uh, two weeks ago, and uh, we have a uh, uh, cooperation with uh, UNDB in addition to uh, two investment uh, uh, international banks uh, by their sustainable teams uh, to assist our uh, uh, work in this field. And previously, uh, as, uh, as we have uh, Mr. Yushif uh, from World Bank, previously in our green bond issuance, we received the technical assistance from World Bank uh, sustainable team uh, uh, post issuance uh, in finalizing and preparing our uh, impact report, and it was a great, a great and very good uh, uh, learning process for us. Having World Bank uh, 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 with us on the technical assistance side to produce the, the impact report. Uh, so. To focus more on, on, on your question regarding the, uh, uh, the aim of our sustainable framework to achieve the SDGs, yes, we, uh, we are doing so in order to, uh, in, yeah, to emphasize and to, uh, uh, to, uh, yeah, to fulfill our commitment, Egypt, uh, uh, govern, uh, government of Egypt commitment uh, for uh, is, uh, United Nations SDG goals. Uh, thank you, Emma. I suppose we'll definitely come on to Yoshi a bit later about this, the role that institutions like the World Bank can have in, in, in risk sharing, but also technical assistance as well. I wanted to stay with you, though, and ask about um, ratings and whether you think a country's performance on the SDGs could be manifested more strongly in the sovereign credit rating assessment. I mean, Andrew had already 
um, mentioned how rating agencies are looking at these criteria more closely. Is this something that you're having to consider as well? Yes, definitely, definitely. Because as long as we deal with rating agencies now, uh, they are, especially after we issued the green bond, we have more obligation uh, to, uh, yani, uh, to answer their questions regarding uh, uh, our commitment and what we can do and what we have did before uh, under uh, support of, uh, of climate change initiatives. Thank you, Emma. Maybe, Andrew, just bring you in on the same question. You mentioned it already a bit, but do you, do you think we're going down the road where the a country's or region's performance on the SDGs will affect its rating? Oh, absolutely, I, th I think it does. I mean, we're already seeing uh, rating agencies embedding their views on climate change and approach to ESG as part of the ratings criteria, although it sits a little bit behind the scenes. I mean, ultimately, uh, we've had a view for a long period of time that as investors require more disclosures and look, look taking a step back, the disclosures that we are going to have to provide around our sustainable bond framework are going to be as rigorous as if we were to do a single green bond. So we're not, we're not looking to reduce our workload. If anything, we're taking on a bigger workload piece. Um, but in terms of how I see this, how, how I see this playing out is that ultimately I think there will be uh, a layered approach to ratings, and that is we will have standalone credit ratings assessing the financials of a uh, particular institution or sovereign, and then we will also have an ESG rating. And I know there are already ESG ratings or sustainability ratings that exist, but I think they'll be far more robust than what is currently in existence. And, they, and then we'll have what may necessarily be an aggregated rating bringing together the financial and the ESG score into what may be an overall assessment from a financial and sustainability perspective of an issuer or sovereign or corporate or whatever happens to be. So there's a lot of work, I think, that still needs to be done in creating a homogenised standard for where uh, the benchmark or baseline is going to be for how you make these assessments. Uh, you know, for what we're doing and how we're going about our review and where we think it sits, the, uh, the uh, impact standards, I think, are a very good place to start. We've also got the, um, you've got the ICMA standards as well. So... You know, there's a number of ways that you can start to build the case up, but ultimately, as investors require more disclosure and more transparency around your reporting, that the need for uh, rating agencies to be more proactive in delivering uh, a more holistic rating and a more transparent rating that definitely embeds uh, climate risk and more, uh, more importantly, the, the review of the alignments to the SDGs, then that's where I think we're going to be heading longer term which probably underpins where, where our thought processes have been driving for a long period of time in developing our sustainable bond framework. Oh, thanks, Andrew. Well, investors are always going to want more information, despite issuers' Never. best efforts of uh, giving them as much as they think they should. But um, yeah, obviously, go, taking the route you have uh, on this, you, you mentioned workload. I just wanted to ask, because you've obviously had to engage with market participants and investors on, on how you're tackling this. And, and that's necessitated a greater need for you to engage with all these different stakeholders to, to, to achieve the, the, the process you want to. I think you, were, you already mentioned it, but has this actually made more work for you than just simply doing a, a label bond to begin with and then seeing where that goes? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the level of engagement that we've had to have across government and you know, like all governments, we have changes of governments over periods of time. Uh, you now we had a state election here in March. We've just recently had a federal election as well. We've, so we've had changes of government at state and federal level, and they've all got very different agendas. So that level of engagement uh, and understanding and, and knowing that each government will come in with its own different agenda, its own goals, uh, its own approach to what it's considering regarding climate change, regarding how it's going to target net zero or you know, what its targets are for 2030 and whether they're going to embed them in legislation or refer to them as guidelines. You know, they're, they're really important considerations. So the level of engagement that we've had to have at the state and federal level to understand what those agendas look like so we can help formulate 
our own strategy to try and influence the, the direction for the best possible outcomes so we can provide the, the best level of disclosure. So the, the uh, yeah, so not just engaging with investors, not just engaging with our banks who act for us in markets, but the across and intra-government uh, work that we've had to do. You know, South Australia, for example, had a climate change action plan uh, delivered in 2007. So it's not like the work hasn't been done. It's about how is that being implemented and how is it being articulated and what can we lean on that's within that existing legislation to inform investors or to help drive future policy decisions. Great, thanks, Andrew. Now, just going back to Yoshi, I want to or just change directions slightly. Uh, obviously, the World Bank uh, has launched this a partnership fund for the SDGs. Could you tell us a bit more about that uh, and what is the aim? Yeah, sorry that uh, I'm not fully involved in that partnership fund for SDGs. However, um, um, I, I can explore the, the, the important points uh, for this uh, um, uh, uh, alliance. So uh, the World Bank, for the World Bank, especially IBRD, uh, the partnership and uh, the engagement uh, with the private sector investors uh, and other organizations is extremely uh, important. Uh, in fact, uh, the outstanding balance of the IBRD loan uh, is almost as same as the outstanding balance of the World Bank bonds uh, uh, purchased by the uh, mostly private sector uh, investors, meaning without the money from uh, private sector investors, uh, World Bank cannot um, do business at all. So, and um, in the past, uh, the bond investors uh, uh, made the uh, investment decision uh, 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 decision uh, uh, based on uh, the, the yield, the financial return, um, like, uh, like a spread over government securities and, uh, um, and also, of course, uh, compare uh, the financial return with the, 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 the credit, uh, credit ratings. Uh, and also the other aspect is that the liquidity. Um, so, but uh, as we all know, uh, the investors are more keen on uh, the use of proceeds. And if their money uh, is contributing to the global society. So in that respect, uh, uh, for us, uh, it's getting more and more uh, important uh, to have a direct engagement uh, with uh, investors. Uh, so for I, I have uh, two, uh, good, I think, good examples. One is that the going back to 2007, um, I, I have a discussion uh, with uh, one a private sector uh, asset management company, uh, Nikko Asset Management, and uh, we discussed, uh, can we make, cre uh, originate uh, the, 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 at that time, social responsible investing uh, product for retail investors in Japan? And we came up with the idea uh, that the, the, the mutual fund ex invest exclusively in uh, World Bank bonds with, uh, in a multiple uh, currency denominated. Uh, and the theme of the, the, the investment trust, a mutual fund was, uh, uh, the, uh, actually nickname uh, of the fund was a uh, world supporter. So even before SDGs, uh, we uh, started such kind of a, a direct uh, engagement uh, with the financial partners uh, to provide uh, uh, the, the uh, good uh, financial products uh, for, for, for uh, investors. The other important uh, uh, partnership was uh, the, with the GPIF. Uh, in 2018, uh, we had a chance to have direct dis discussions uh, with the uh, GPIF, uh, government pension investment fund, the largest uh, uh, public fund uh, in the world. Um, and they say they wanted to introduce uh, ESG uh, invest, uh, investment uh, uh, procedure uh, to their, their huge portfolio, uh, the bond portfolio. And um, uh, we uh, have a, a joint study together and launched a joint report uh, on uh, the introducing ESG into bond investment. And that report uh, in Japanese and in English. And that, that report was uh, well 
uh, accepted by many institutional investors. And I, we have a feeling that since then, uh, the many social bond uh, we uh, are issued uh, in a, in a, in a global uh, capital market. So uh, the point is, um, uh, the world, even World Bank is a, a relatively large institution uh, to tackle the 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 the, the huge uh, issues uh, that uh, the the human being uh, is facing cannot be sorted out uh, with a single institution. So we need. Uh, the support from private sector and also other public organizations uh, and collaborate and engage uh, engage more uh, to tackle uh, the the many uh, the, uh, many issues. Thank you, Yoshi. Well, maybe I'll, I'll stay with you on that about you talking about obviously big issues facing humanity and and the human race. Um, we, is it possible we could have a much bigger impact on the global sustainability agenda if we were, had more focus on making brown activities light brown or light green instead of painting already dark green things, even with uh, making them a little bit greener? How do, is this something the World Bank's very focused on, this, this kind of transition and, and making it a just transition, as you say? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, actually, the, the, the latest uh, bond issue strategy is really uh, in line uh, with uh, just what you said. Uh, so uh, we say uh, beyond green and uh, also uh, incorporating uh, green factors to, to, to the entire balance sheet uh, of, the, of the World Bank. Uh, so that's why. We did. We are not sticking to issuing green bonds, uh, and uh, we uh, wanted to explore uh, the holistic approach uh, of integrating, uh, tackling green factors to everything uh, we are doing. So um, that's why. Uh, and uh, for example, the education uh, projects. Uh, 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 no, uh, we have uh, many opportunities to build uh, new schools uh, and facilities. Right. So. Uh, we, uh, our standard guideline uh, strictly uh, suggests uh, that uh, the, the, the new building must be really environmental friendly. And, uh, and the, uh, the other example is that the recently uh, we issued the, the theme bond with the road safety and the Japanese casualty insurance company uh, purchased uh, the bond. Uh, but for, even for the road safety, of course, uh, our ultimate target is uh, help, help people, saving as many as possible people. But on the process of that, uh, uh, the road safety is uh, uh, important uh, to protect people uh, from uh, traffic accident and so forth. But that's at the same time, uh, like a uh, like project like a uh, building, uh, the, the, the wide uh, road, of course, uh, we have to, be careful for the environmental damage, uh, but it will uh, enable uh, to introduce public transportation uh, to, to, to that particular uh, country uh, region. Um, with a, uh, for example, in Colombia, we we made the exclusive uh, lane uh, for the environmental friendly uh, bus, and, and by doing so, uh, the many people start. Uh, um, start taking bus instead of driving uh, cars by themselves to the, to, to to commute. So uh, many projects, uh, you know, influencing each other. Uh, and uh, the important thing is that uh, we always uh, need to think about uh, what we can do uh, to tackle uh, climate change uh, issues. That's the the current the the, the World Bank Group approach. And uh, IBRD I think achieved uh, thirty six percent. Uh, uh, fi uh, outstanding balance loan uh, tackling uh, the climate change issues, and we will continue uh, this approach. Well, thank you, Yoshi. Of course, yeah, all these projects have known consequences and sometimes unknown consequences as well. Um, maybe, Natalia, I'll bring you back in here on that question, really. What, how or what role does biodiversity or preserving and also restoring natural resources play in IFAD's sustainable finance framework? 
Thanks, Adam. So indeed, we're, when we look at uh, the project types that IFAD supports, uh, we are focused 100% on rural agriculture, as I said, but within that space, it's really a 360 degree. And we really have actually one project type that is really labeled environment and natural resource management. And this is all about restoring and maintaining landscapes, essentially. And we have many activities under that category of project, so to speak. Um, for example, sustainable water management, sustainable forest management, um, agroforestry system management, um, habitat and, and wildlife conservation. So, and we have going back to the core indicators that I was saying we measure, because this is an indication of the activities. We have actually 15 core indicators that focus, that pertain to, this, to these project types. Um, for, so focusing specifically on biodiversity is very interesting because of course, uh, biodiversity, you know, whether it's um, species biodiversity or ecosystem biodiversity, is is a foundation pillar for livelihoods. And in fact, I think there was there was a study that showed that um, biodiversity is actually needed or contributes to fourteen to fourteen out of seventeen SDGs. And of course, the the lack of biodiversity really affects smallholders and agriculturals in these rural areas specifically. And so there's been an increased focus in IFAD on biodiversity to the point where just last year, December, we have approved a dedicated biodiversity strategy um, that really focuses on four areas. The first one is embedding biodiversity really at design stage of our project. So when IFAD sits down with the governments together and you know designs an intervention, a project or a program really um, including the lenses of biodiversity in the in the project design. Um, the second area is really about innovation in biodiversity, which that biodiversity in and on itself lends itself for trying to do innovative techniques. And this is something that IFAD is really trying to focus on in its projects. Um, then there is a very strong focus about partnerships in biodiversity and really extracting lessons learned from the project that IFAD sustains and started sustaining even in the past. If you apply a lens of biodiversity, what can we learn? What kind of feedback loops we can have for the for the new for the new designs? And uh, we are also developing a specific indicator to measure the results of this strategy, which will be then fully embedded in the next results management framework of IFAD. So there's been a big a big increase of the theme of biodiversity in IFA just in the last couple couple of years. Thank you, Natalia. Maybe, Aman, I'd like to bring you back in here, going back more to the sort of the, the, the financing. Um, obviously, Islamic finance and sustainable finance, they seem like they have a lot of um, similarities in some ways. But how does Islamic finance principles interact with conventional sustainable finance? And uh, what role will the cooks play uh, in the future of sustainable funding? Um, yeah, yes, for sure. Uh, Islamic uh, formats of assurances also will support this uh, this area of sustainable development uh, goals. Um, for for uh, from our side, uh, Egypt is already launched the Sukuk uh, uh, program, uh, but because of the market condition that we are all aware of now, uh, yani it's difficult to to issue the first uh, Sukuk issuance. But we still have a program of sustainability uh, of sustainable uh, sustainable uh, uh, yani, uh, program that we are aiming to uh, issue uh, a, a sustainable sukuk uh, under green format, green sukuk in future. Uh, we are waiting uh, for the market to be uh, good for us and to find a good win to, uh, to release the first sukuk issuance. Hopefully that we can do the green sukuk at that time. And uh, uh, I wanted to tell you also to uh, about the uh, successful of uh, uh, yeah, the success pillars of our green issuance when we issued the green bond uh, in September 2020. Uh, actually, it received a very good uh, demand from investors. Uh, we uh, we received thirty uh, uh, focused uh, EEG investors uh, for first time to uh, 
good bids in Egypt uh, bond, and we succeeded to price uh, uh, the bond below the 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 part of that as uh, the curve by twelve point. Uh, five basis point as a negative new uh, issue concession in addition to enable us uh, the issuance and the massive demands that we received on the book that was enabling us to reduce the interest uh, rate by 50 basis point uh, compared to its IBC levels. And at that time, uh, it was a five year tenor uh, 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 tranche and it was uh, achieving the lowest coupon uh, because only it was green and this is encouraging us to go uh, more for a sustainable bond because it's perceived very good from investors compared to other uh, conventional bond it also enable us to price it uh, below the curve which achieving also uh, one of our goals to uh, lower the cost of uh, of our debt. Uh, hopefully, only to find a good window in near future to come back again uh, to the market uh, with uh, sustainable formats, uh, whether it will be Islamic Sukuk green bond or uh, another uh, green uh, bond. And uh, along with our uh, uh, work on sustainable framework, we have intention to issue gender bond and social uh, in addition to blue bond. Thank you, Aman. Yeah, this whole, this whole green goes rainbow uh, that we're seeing with different types of uh, yes. uh, issues being addressed by the different funding programs as well. Maybe um, we're coming to the end of the, the time for our panel discussion. So what I'd like to do is perhaps uh, invite each of you to to give a bit of thought on, on what will your next steps be in your sustainable funding agenda? Uh, and perhaps, Andrew, I can start with you. Yeah. Well, given, you know, we're well down our journey to being able to deliver on what we've set out to do. So as I say, we've recently uh, been able to get the approval for the governance group that will sit within the budget um, cabinet committee to help drive the agenda across government. Uh, the next piece will be uh, the delivery of SAFA's financial statements, followed by South Australia's mid-year budget review alignment uh, being, being public. So you know, ultimately, the goal is when we can actually come out with our formal uh, sustainable bond framework. And again, that, and, and as well as the uh, continual engagement, both across government and with investors and with banks. So, you know, we're just continuing to push down the path that we're going down. And it's just really a matter of when and not if that we're able to deliver on the agenda that we've set out to achieve. Thank you, Andrea. And maybe the same question to Yoshi. Of course, Yoshi, you said that the World Bank would like to cover every SDG if it could. Um, but what are the next steps for the, the World Bank Treasury? Yeah, in a, in a long, long term, uh, uh, we still continue uh, to keep on issuing a large scale bond uh, to meet the demand for financing uh, and uh, provide uh, liquid and high quality products uh, for, for the global uh, investor base. On the other hand, at the same time, uh, we would like to keep on tackling a kind of a micro uh, issues, not microfinance, uh, but uh, uh, for example, recently uh, we issued, uh, uh, not recently, six months ago, we issued uh, the so-called so Rhino bond uh, that the coupon uh, performance uh, links to, the, to the, the, the growth rate of a black light rhino uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a national parks uh, in the uh, Republic of South Africa. So um, uh, this is a really unique uh, product and not many investors uh, actually were able to purchase, but uh, we uh, could place uh, as much as 100 million US equivalent, which is big. Uh, and uh, that proceeds uh, uh, will support, uh, not exactly the, the, the principle, but uh, the coupon uh, structure uh, will support uh, uh, the people in a, in a republic. So this and investors are willing to have, of course, safe investment. But they, at the same time, uh, though uh, many investors have different agenda, and uh, to meet uh, those agenda, we need also 
uh, keep on, um, in, uh, you know, um, studying how we can issue the, the unique structured bond to tackle unique uh, issues. Uh, and uh, the bio, uh, this is a really interesting product uh, to tackle bio uh, diversity uh, issues. Also, uh, we issued uh, uh, the not even not only coupon but also principal performance linked to uh, the the donation uh, uh, growth of the UNICEF. It was a highly risk bond and uh, not even rated uh, uh, because the, the, there's a uh, risk for the principal. Uh, but uh, uh, the Japanese life insurance company Daiichi Life uh, purchased uh, almost all share uh, of the bond, um, and uh, um, uh, that uh, proves that uh, as long as we structure a suitable project uh, product uh, for investors, investors willing to take uh, the, the, the risk other than uh, the market and financial risk, uh, we need to uh, put efforts uh, to, to, to issue uh, those kind of uh, unique uh, structured one too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that, that type of unique stretching opens a whole range of different uh, causes and needs that can be covered uh, by this type of funding. And then probably Natalia as well, yourself, the same question. Thank you. And of course, Joshi, we've been following very closely, you know, the both, of course, the Rhino bond, but also the bond that you did for, for UNICEF. It was indeed a, a great. So, yes. <laughs> um, so for IFAD, so IFAD, as I said, we just started issuing this year. So we're kind of the new kid on the block. <laughs> and this is where we will put all of our efforts. You know, we, we, we believe to have there is no question about the fact that the needs are there. As I said, unfortunately, we believe to have we have a very strong credit rating. We have 40 years of track record of delivering results. Um, and so this is where all of our efforts are going to be in the next months and years, as far as we're concerned, which is building our name as an issuer in the market, um, plugging ourselves more and more into and partnering much more with investors that have also, and not only, of course, are after our, our good credit and our yield, but also really sustain the mission, which is why we make it very explicit also in our borrowing framework that we'd like to partner with investors that are very vocal about their own support of the SDGs, of ESGs aspects. And uh, we are now, we issued the two product placements under sustainable bond framework. It is not to exclude that in the future, we will also go into thin bonds, but as I said at the beginning, themes that resonate with the activities and with, you know, with IFA, what IFA really, really does on the ground. So we, uh, it's very clear to us that it's uh, our tapping into financial markets is not, uh, is, is there to stay. And then this is where all of our efforts will be put, building a funding curve, making sure that, you know, we are part of this new arena for IFA, which is also as, not only, of course, for funding, but the great thing about entering into um, this kind of financial markets is really an advocacy for IFAD mission. It is really an advocacy for IFAD in all an arena that maybe didn't know us before, because we are indeed a smaller agency. So there's always opportunities whenever I talk to investors really to really showcase uh, what IFAD does. And, and this is as important actually for me, because there are many other activities and many collaborations that come out of this, uh, or that can come out of uh, these partnerships far beyond actually, um, you know, the bond issuance as such. So this is very important. This is where we will be going, continuing on the good path that we just started actually. Thank you, Natalia. Well, investors, you heard it, you heard it here first. So there we go. Uh, Oman, maybe um, you, you uh, already mentioned a bit of the next steps and, and the different types of themes you, you may be issuing. But if you did want to add anything to that, let me know. Or, or perhaps if you wanted to mention or comment on any of the big challenges you've had, uh, and that will take us to a nice conclusion of the, of the panel. Yes, sure. So from our experience, the biggest challenge is that we faced uh, during issuing the green bond and now when we are preparing for upgrading the, uh, the green financing framework to a sustainable one, it's a level of awareness in other ministries. Yani, uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, 
Andrew is aware of that because uh, yani he worked on sustainable formats of issuances and the level of awareness in other ministries uh, uh, should be raised uh, internally by the government in order to let them know about uh, the importance of, of this uh, kind of issuances and how to collect the, uh, uh, the, the right data and uh, what will be sufficient for uh, the KPIs and on technical sides because a part of the green bond is very technical for the environmentally uh, uh, KPIs analysis. Uh, this is for uh, uh, yes uh, to be aligned with ICMA standard and uh, also when we involved with the external reviewer uh, about the due diligence was not easy. Uh, it, it went in a very detailed uh, oriented questionnaires. Uh, uh, all of these issues should be uh, yani tackled from an early stage by. Uh, uh, the government uh, itself uh, in order to ease the process of, of the issuance afterwards. And my last comment, to, uh, I would like just to say, I mean, the sustainable financing deals is a very unique process and could be described uh, really exhaustive and full of extensive hard work and ongoing operation uh, with different internal and external parts, but really it works. And although it's a must to be uh, a, a pivotal pillar of every debt management strategy, and by time that would be replaced uh, uh, by a conventional type of issuances of financing. And final comment, it really works as an No, Thank you, Amanda. That's a very good way for us to end and uh, no thank you for your contributions and to all of our speakers uh, for joining us today and for all your time as well so thank you andrew in adelaide thank you to yoshi in tokyo thank you to natalia in rome and thank you to Erman in cairo uh, to all of you as well as uh, vice president kasali in manila earlier and for frank shaidig uh, in frankfurt opening up the conversation as well um so i will bring the panel to a close there and also uh, this DZ Bank sponsored seminar at the ADB annual meetings and from me in Singapore um, I wish you a very good day and enjoy the rest of the annual meetings thank you thank you thank you very much